slides. Uh, you girls can hit a record whenever. <sighs> Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, right now, we are starting officially uh, uh, this uh, last panel of the International Forum 2022, the colonial perspectives um, on gender, sexuality, and patriarchy, art, activism, and academia. Uh, today, uh, we have a really, really great uh, panel titled The Colonial Strategies and uh, our idea was basically uh, to discuss where we can decolonize our thinking and our our action and the fronts that we put uh, to um, uh, to create a more uh, equalitarian society in which we can think instead from the north to the south, but from the south to the north. Uh, I have the panelists here. I am so glad that you guys are here with me today, with us today. Uh, thank you so much for, for being present and to bring these wonderful presentations. I really look forward to it. I really like to thank as well Fanny Oye and Yu Elin that will be our tech support today. These girls are awesome. And I'm going to uh, introduce our first speaker uh, of this uh, panel. It is uh, Luis Ribeiro Fonseca. He's a musician, a journalist, and a master's degree student at Federal Fluminense University. Ufi in the program of uh, in the graduate program of communication in Brazil. As a musician, Luis composes soundtracks uh, for cinema movies. In 2020, heading uh, the Brazilian band Rasga Mortalha, he released the album Hibrido. As a journalist, he is editor of the Café Colombo, a cultural newsletter, and in the academic field, he's part of Musilab. Laboratory of Interdisciplinary Studies in Music and Culture that is headed uh, by uh, Professor Felipe Trota. He also presented a paper in this, in this event. Uh, and Luis researches the first recordings of Maracatu, a Brazilian music gender, genre, and its relation to Black culture, Latin America politics, and archive studies. Luis is going to present his paper today that is titled Thinking About Stereo Modernism Through Brazilian Maracatu and the Calonga Song. Please, Luis, the mic is yours. Thank you, Beatrice. Uh, let me share my screen. Just a minute. So everyone can see, I imagine. So, uh, let me see it. Uh, hello, good morning to my colleagues in Brazil and good afternoon to everybody all around the world. My name is Luiz Ribeiro Fonseca. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank you, the Colonial Perspectives teams. They are very caring and attentive as organizers of this event. And more than that, the effort is essential to our field. So my presentation here is called Thinking About Stereo Modernism through Brazilian Maracatu and the Calunga song. What I want to talk about here is music, specifically an Afro-Brazilian kind of music called Maracatu, sung and danced in Pernambuco, a northeastern state of Brazil, during the carnival festivities. In the practice, many groups called Nations of Maracatu parade among the streets, dance, sing ballads, and play percussion instruments, such as alfaias and gongues. My proposal in this discussion is, one, to demonstrate the passage of maracatu through the music and movie industry, taking into account a song called Kalunga, one of the first registers of the genre, and two, to examine the trajectory of the song as an object of musical transit 
that highlight its dimensions as black music and their colonial strategy. I also would like to present to you a concept that guides my thought, stereo modernism proposed by Tsitsi Elejaji, a Zimbabwean writer. Stereo modernism is a way to see the multiple crossings between African writers, musicians, and film directors, and their manners to develop art in dialogue with Afro-diasporic subjects on different continents. So whereas Elijaji thinks about the relationship between African countries and the United States and Europe over the 10th, 20th century, we can turn our eyes to Brazilian music and think about the Maracatu as a field that mixes folk culture, phonographic industry, and foreigner influences. Portuguese music is one of them, but, it, but we can also quote Angola's influence as a very important factor to think about Maracatu and the main object here, the Kalunga song. But what is Kalunga, you may ask? It's a black doll that is raised during the Maracatu parade and symbolizes the ancestors from the Middle Passage. In such a manner, Kalunga evokes the colonial past and the anti-slavery struggle through imagetic symbols. Therefore, my presentation is divided into three aspects. One, the first record of Kalunga, two, the re-recording of the song by Amalia Rodriguez, and three, the stereo modern way that popular and folk music can act and travel as an agent of memory, change, and resistance. So first, I would like to show the first version of Kalunga. Camera! Kalunga was composed by Capiba, a Brazilian maestro and songwriter, and released in 1937 by Columbia Records. In that same year, the song appeared in a film called O Samba da Vida, or The Samba of Life. The dancer that you saw is playback in Mar Henrique, an Afro-Brazilian singer. The scenario and the clothes of the, the characters is a mimic of the complex relationship between religions of African heritage such as Candomblé, Umbanda, and the Catholic Church. Now, I would like to travel with you 30 years into the future and show you the 1960 version of Calunga, played by Amalia Rodrigues, well known as a Portuguese singer of Fado. So, 
I think we can speak about three levels of this music journey guided by Kalunga. One, the oral nature of maracatu, of early maracatu, by the way. Two, the artistic intervention that changes maracatu's music and integrates it into the music industry in Brazil. And three, the radical change of Emilia Rodriguez re-recording. But what is the bond between these two versions? The musical and literary aspects of this song constantly refers to the colonial past. Uh, at Luanda, Angola's capital, is frequently reminded and Kalung is a kind of entity that gives supernatural protection during the dangerous sea crossing that divides Brazil and Africa. The musical modulation between the first part of the song and the chorus functions, if we can think here, as an element of tension that intertwines voice and chord. Quoting José Miguel Wisnik, we can ask ourselves what is the meaning of the sound, and more than that, what the sound produces in terms of decolonial strategy, that is, a way to, through the music, subvert or even destroy the colonial codes. Following this, we can speak about the idea of a stereo modern archive or even a decolonial archive, a fragment of a fragment that resonates on both sides of the Atlantic, creating a kind of a new middle passage. This fragment is constructed in complex and sometimes contradictory paths. But at the same time, it exposes a bond that blurs the line between modern and traditional and highlights the Kalunga song and the Maracatu as an active tool in the volatile entanglement between Black culture and modernism in Latin America, Africa, and Europe, spread worldwide through mass media. So uh, the original configuration of the song is changed by the austerity of Amalia's version, but her way of singing gives the song a strength and a melancholy that alludes, alludes to the first version, but in a different way, a Portuguese way. At the same time, the fado touches the maracatu and maracatu touches and hacks the fado, creating one scenario in which these two genres negotiate new and stereo modern Atlantic relations that is, North and South relations. Therefore, to conclude this presentation, I would also like to call attention to the noise of the 1937 recording as an important aspect of the aural spectrum. The noise here functions as a metaphor for the time. On the other hand, a time that is quoted by the song's lyrics and music. On the other hand, a time that the song itself provokes creating challenging gaps and imaginaries. Lastly, I would like to apologize for my English and quote to Beth Frey, the famous Brazilian sociologist, who once said, in Portuguese, I can dance, in English, I can only walk. Thank you very much for your attention. Stop share. Thank you, Luiz. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so on uh, to our... Uh, next presenter, Genoveva Vargas Solar. Uh, oh, yes, uh, before that, uh, we are having the discussions after all the three uh, panelists present. Uh, so, uh, but if you have urgent questions, I think you can ask on the on, via chat uh, or then wait for the presentations uh, to start. And now, on to Genoveva Vargas Sola. Uh, she's a, a principal scientist at the French Council for Science and Research and is a qualified research director. Uh, Genoveva is attached to the LIDIS Lyon Laboratory. From 2008 to 2020, she was a deputy director of LAFMIA or L-A-F-M-I-A, -A. I'm sorry if I pronounced this wrong, at the Sin, the Sin Vestaf in Mexico. She's a regular member of the Mexican Academy of Computing, uh, and she's also an active feminist in the search for the colonial alternatives to data management, artificial intelligence, and the large-scale execution platforms. Scientifically, Genoveva Vargas Solar is a multidisciplinary on principle. She developed from undergraduate to PhD in a dual expertise with an education in Latin American literature 
and Computer System Engineering at the undergraduate level at the University of the Americas in Puebla, and is a research on uh, the imaginary, an area of comparative literature and computer science at MSc and a PhD level at Stendhal University and Joseph Fourier University, respectively, respectively, and uh, that are both in France. She coordinates several projects in Europe and Latin America, funded by government and industry. She promotes scientific cooperation in various regions of the world with a special focus on Europe and Latin America. She has been active in think tanks on the participation of women in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, in particular Latinas in computing and in the Latin America Conference of Informatics. She is a member of the digital activist group Tierra Común and participates in the Feminist Alliance A+, that promotes feminist and inclusive artificial intelligence. She leads the J-O-W-G-I-S-A-I and Symphonia projects on the study of women's workforce in data science and artificial intelligence in the global north and south, funded by CNR, CNRS AAP and Gender Institute programs. Today, she's going to present to us her really, really interesting paper calling for a feminist revolt to decolonize data and algorithms in the age of datification. Thank you so much, uh, Genoveva, to be here with us. The Thank mic you. is yours. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. And of course, thank you for, because we are arriving to the last date of, of a very exciting event. Our minds are like uh, in revolt inside <laughs> with uh, so many ideas. And for this, I want to thank uh, organizers particularly. Um, so uh, sorry to move from artistic glorious environment into uh, hardware and in silico uh, perspective. I apologize for this, but uh, I promise that I will try to be uh, not as, uh, as glorious as uh, Luis, but at least not as hard and boring as uh, technology might uh, be. Uh, so uh, the first thing that I want to do is uh, talk, of course, about uh, datification. And uh, uh, in fact, datification uh, was uh, introduced by uh, Kenneth Koch here and Victor Meyer Schoenberger, uh, and it refers to the possibility of generating digital twins, so a digital version of us or of everything, um, of every being and thing on earth, thanks to sensors, data, and algorithms. But in fact, I believe that datification is not an abstract concept. It is a project of society, of global order, and in my opinion, it is a colonization project. In this sense, I argue that it should be considered controversial and even barbarian, because in a datified world, neoliberal processes are beyond the limits of the material world, beyond time, and also beyond geographical um, location. The question that guides uh, my uh, statement uh, today is given there in uh, the bottom of the slide is which are the opportunities to consider if we believe that we should revert this digital colonization. So is this possible? And when I talk about digital colonization, I'm adhering to the, the uh, definition given uh, by Nick Aldry and Ulises Mejias, which says that uh, colon the digital and data colonization means the combination of predatory extractive practices of historical colonialism with the abstract quantification methods of computing. 
to discuss uh, this question, uh, I will organize the reminder of, uh, of my statement in two parts. And I promise that I will try to synchronize with the, with the slides in the, in the reminder of, of the presentation. Uh, the first part concerns a kind of problem statement that I will uh, organize as a denunciation. Uh, so as I have said, uh, the datification project aims at reaching the physical and the immaterial collective and individual counties, what we would call imaginary and imagination. Global North and South countries aligned to neoliberalist perception of global order see in this project an opportunity to observe, control, and tune lives, beliefs, and thoughts without people even being aware. Thus, the opportunities opened by datification can be considered as the ultimate evolution of humanity. Let us uh, see how. The idea is to develop technological actions based on the processing of massive collections of data so that no place is unreachable and so that people can be progressively formatted to believe and organize their aims according to the ideals of savage capitalism values injected by the digital hegemony. In a very uh, schematic description of these uh, technologies, which are, uh, which are the tools to build a datified world, we can consider two elements, big data and artificial intelligence that combined led uh, to a new emerging science called uh, data science that represents the scientific and mechanical materialization of datification. Now, the data science method is partially based on data harvesting. So we are going to uh, harvest uh, enormous uh, uh, collections of data and what we call preparing this. And when you talk about preparing the data, you are going to profile, clean, and particularly to engineer uh, this data. And this calls, um, well, this is a huge work, and this calls to crowdsourcing practices, considering new employment possibilities. And the promise with these new employment possibilities are flexibility, independence, and freedom. People annotate uh, the content, and it's called tagging uh, data items, so images, videos, sound, or validate the admissibility of that content in a digital platform according to specific criteria dictated by the values of an invisible controlling entity. Um, the repetitive task, uh, task of, of tagging uh, is intended, in fact, to train artificial intelligence. So we have humans working for artificial intelligence to perform cl uh, complex classification tasks. Uh, identification of nudity in images, images and video with violent or criminal content. Uh, people most work in very precarious uh, forms. Uh, um, that uh, are con uh, continuous production uh, settings. They want to, uh, um, and if they do not adhere to this uh, massive production setting, they cannot reach minimum salary. Uh, the poorly annotated items are not paid. The person is sanctioned and the payment per item is reduced or the access to work um, is uh, to the work offer is reduced for some period of time. So crowdsourcing is uh, far away from ideal employment. It is in fact a new form of digital slavery where workers called collaborators often face solo childcare and long-term unemployment. The view of shocking content with data generates mental distress. And of course, companies do not provide anything like computers or electricity support or anything. You have to pay on your own in order to, um, to, deal, to work. And so um, I would say that um, this uh, way of organizing labor is a kind of uh, 
can be similar to the plantations we knew in uh, previous colonial uh, colonialized uh, uh, countries. And uh, the condemnation is hunger, is illness and poverty. And the problem also is that guilt uh, is in, the, in, in workers because they feel responsible of their own marginal condition. So you are not working hard, you are not adhering to the project and this is why you are poor. Um, so um, the second aspect of, of data science is analytics. Uh, and here uh, the data science methodology is ensured by algorithms based on the principle of uh, uh, it, that it is possible to model any social, physical and natural phenomenon, including people's behavior through variables and understand these phenomena through quantification methods used by algorithms. So all the spirit and all the uh, glorious aspects of humanity are lost into this uh, uh, strict uh, setting. Uh, and then uh, algorithms are of course uh, adopting uh, uh, underlying perspectives. Uh, for example, they use by gender criteria to define classification groups. So you have male and female, uh, black and white, developed, underdeveloped, rich and poor. And in fact, these algorithms re patriarchalize physical and digital spaces uh, operating through uh, the homogenization under a dangerous veneer of objectivity and scientific truth. So since these are algorithms, this is mathematics, this is objective, and so we should believe in their findings. And there is no possibility of questioning uh, them. Um, so um, with this example of, of denunciation, um, I'm going to move, well, this talks more or less about, about what I did. So I will move to uh, the second part of my, of my talk. And uh, the second part of my talk, I called it Feminist Digital Revolt. Um, so here is hope. <laughs> Uh, feminist perspectives consider gender an essential category to understand the harm and figure uh, out insurrection actions. So let's go for it. And uh, in order um, uh, with actions that empower uh, the people that are also us <laughs> that are in, in this uh, um, uh, metaverse. So uh, practices like crowdsourcing, numerical classification and continuous digital sur uh, surveillance are turned into positive actions. And uh, these methods um, are uh, redefined as collective horizontal mechanisms for communities to create the colonialized digital spaces, and then promote cultural practices, share experiences and knowledge, and provide answers against violence, exclusion, and generalization. Um, feminist uh, and women groups, indigenous communities, and also scholars in the global South and North are that refuse to adhere to uh, hegemonic datification program have started to organize and fight back from inside particularly. The first essential step is to problematize, of course, technology progress, exhibiting the problems of poverty, violence, exclusion, and cultural erase of this uh, supposed progress. And the idea is that they create actions in order uh, to uh, provide, for example, alternative com uh, content. You might have seen in Wikipedia, for example, there are calls that uh, in order to add content that uh, is normally not accepted uh, from the uh, global north or from communities that are not uh, well represented. Um, without denying the importance of this uh, role, uh, I believe that they only, uh, they only scratch the surface of the problem because the epistemic backend and the production model of datification are not questioned. Uh, for this reason, I believe that we must consider a kind of second uh, act, strategy and promote technology, algorithmic and artificial intelligence literacy. Uh, with the object of modifying their methods. Uh, so challenges include revisiting algorithms design, including the questioning uh, 
of resources required to use all this because that's another aspect that is often uh, not uh, evident to everyone is that when we use our uh, uh, research engine when we use artificial intelligence in order to train a, a, an algorithm this is uh, energetic consumption as uh, not possible and the uh, servers that are installed in normally in the global south, uh, they devastate also the places where uh, they are uh, installed. And so every uh, technological action uh, intended to promote datification has ecologic implications and harms bodies and territories. And so uh, the idea would be to start to reorganizing this in terms of sobriety, sobriety strategies. Okay, so that's... Uh, what some of the of um, activist uh, groups are starting to do. So I will mention uh, some of them. Of course, I'm, uh, there are many in the world that are already starting with this demantelizing the um, the economic uh, backend of uh, datification. So I, I, I belong to Terra Común, but there's uh, data active or indigenous data sovereignty in the global north. There's La Sandia Digital in, in Mexico, and they provide archival servers or they uh, give people the right to govern their data, their way they use uh, technology. Uh, yet the question uh, remains open. Uh, how can the colonization activism find viable strategies for dismantling the metaverse to imagine less quantitative and more sensitive kaleidoscopic digital territories as multiverses? So my position is to not have one metaverse if we want to be uh, digital, let's build several metaverses with several alternatives so that we can all be represented in uh, this digital world. So thank you very much. And uh, I uh, leave the floor to my colleague. Thank you so much, Genoveva. This was, this was really amazing. I have... I made a few points, but <laughs> so I look forward to the discussion. Uh, but, Me too, thank you. <laughs> but now I am uh, going uh, to uh, present um, Oscar Ivers. I think uh, I'm saying that right. I'm not sure. Um, he's a lecturer and researcher in the Unit for Academic Literacy at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. For roughly 18 years, his responsibilities in higher education have been to develop students' capabilities in critical communication. Additionally, I was researchers and is concerned about erasure of indigenous culture. Therefore, his view is higher and higher education and disciplinary practitioners have obligations to surface marginalized ways of lives and identities in the curriculum. In this way, Oscar adopts an Afrocentric method of developing students' academic literacies. However, as, as his presentation highlights, African members of indigenous communities and the global North should look before uh, colonial encounters to develop new arguments around socioeconomic, racial, and epistemic inequalities. Today, he's going to present his paper titled African Origins of Social Stratification, Individualism and Capitalism. Please, Oscar. Thank you, colleagues. And um, firstly, to the, the organizers, my, my, my gratitude for everything that you have done. And I think that the waves are being felt and also to the my previous colleagues who have spoken, thank you. You have me on alert right now. And uh, yes, we can move forward to the next slide. So um, colleagues, what I want to share with you first is that um, in this presentation, I'm not trying to devalue the suffering 
and the, the dislocation and the disposition of indigenous people across the globe. I just want to make that point. Now, my, my framework is that um, the problem we are facing in Africa and even where I live in South Africa is that patri patriarchy, femicide and inequality between the genders is still a problem as it was many, many centuries ago. And my view is that we as social scientists have vital roles to play that change these realities, not just in our own domains, but globally. So my, my reasoning is this, is that as, in, as communities of indigenous people, we actually set the original templates or the models of social organization. And um, one of those templates is the division of labor and also the earliest gender inequalities. My, my argument is that that is rooted in Africa. So um, my background is the, the Khoi and the San heritage. These are the first cultural communities that lived in Southern Africa before you had the migration of what are known as, as Bantu speakers. So the original uh, uh, communities in Southern Africa were hunters and gatherers, and they were also pastoralists. And um, what I want to share with you is that at these early phases of existence, for me, that is where, and this is before the encounter with the global North, that is where the tensions, that is where the inequality, that is where the colonization of the mind occurred within communities. And my claim is that even though um, colonists and the global north produced a system that was a lot more, I don't want to uh, measure our suffering, but my claim is that colonialism found cracks in indigenous societies and used them to create the systems, to create the colonial system that we are still attempting to eradicate today. Thank you. Now, to go back to the pre-colonial age, and I'm using my own culture now, is that originally it was men who dominated each other. And if I look at Southern Africa, the, the visibility of that is men dividing, separating from each other because of the desire for power. And the evidence of that is men would name um, communities after themselves. And I've given you some examples there. So in South Africa, you have many mountains that are named after the Khoi and the San people, even though I must mention Khoi and San languages have been eliminated. There's been linguicide in South Africa. So the colonists were very successful in destroying those aspects of life. Nonetheless, what men did was they separated from each other and they said, okay, now you will call yourself Otanikwa. And as if you can see there, the, the language, what that means is that you are now the people of Oteni, or you are the people of Hesse, or you are the people of Kri. And for me, that is the first instantiation of individualism in Africa. And mind you, I'm speaking deliberately about hunters and gatherers because those social modes preceded settled communities. Thank you. Now, what happened was originally the Khoi and San would migrate seasonally. They would stay in an area and feed their, their cattle and um, plant some crops. But then as the season changed, then they would leave that area. And it was always men, it was always males who dominated those clans. And as I mentioned earlier, the larger the communities became, there were competitions amongst men. And the point that I want to make, and I'm not sure if you all are aware of this, is that the Khoi and the San are not one people. They are genetically, they are the same, but the lifestyles are distinct. So the Khoi were the pastoralists. Those were the ones who decided to settle. Those were the ones, those were the men 
who decided to name their communities after themselves, but the San resisted settling. They wanted to maintain that nomadic freedom. And what you had happen again before you had Nguni tribes, the Zulu and the Posa and other groups uh, coming down from the north of Africa is that the Khoi started looking down on the San because there were men amongst the Khoi who recognized that these people do not want to be controlled. They do not want to work for me. They do not want their women to be exploited in our communities. Thank you, we can continue. So I want to switch now. I want to switch from individualism in Southern Africa and I want to go to Northern Africa and demonstrate how in that complex society, the same thing happened, okay? In ancient Egypt, which I call Kemet, um, well, not I'm calling Kemet, Kemet is the original name for Egypt. It means land of the black, just like Ethiopia means land of the black faces in Latin. But you may be interested to know that Ethiopia is not a, um, it's not a European name. Um, it's actually the name for Canaan in the Bible, but Ethiopians call Canaan in the Bible, Ethiopes. So what I want to share with you is like the Khoisan hunter-gatherer and pastoralist society, in Ethiopia, you had kings acquiring immense wealth, power, and land. And the epistemologies in those indigenous African societies, what happened was the kings were aligned with God. In other words, the community cannot prosper. Um, local farmers, traders cannot prosper unless they connect to this identity of the king. And therefore, kings like certain Khoi and San um, men began to acquire, acquire immense wealth and land and power, and so did their lineages. And my argument is that from the tip of Southern Africa and to the north, that is a if I want to say analytically for, for researchers who are interested in the African or indigenous context, that is a way to understand how the colonial system that was eventually imposed on us came to be. Those are the African roots. Thank you. Now, I'm a linguist and writing and reading and text on and, and even art and um, if I listen carefully, I'm so tempted to speak to my two colleagues, but I won't go there now. The point I want to make is this, is that writing originated in Africa. There are arguments that China and other areas of the globe, there was systemic writing. My claim is that before 3200 BC, Africans were writing in ancient commit. And my claim is this, whereas the Khoi and the San um, use oral means to dismantle communal societies, communal um, knowledge systems. Writing was used by powerful priests and scribes in ancient Egypt to uphold the power of the kings and the monarchies. And it was so powerful because it whereas before the elders or the senior members of the community would help determine the value systems or help negotiate um, management or interactions with land or cattle or even seasonal migrations. What writing did was it produced official doctrine. Therefore, individual men could say, now we are, we are supreme. It is in law, it is written. You cannot change what has been written. Thereafter, Egypt society changed from being egalitarian like the Khoi and San to folk, and again, I mentioned marginalizing the wisdom of elders and giving the power to individuals. Uh, thank you, we can continue. So now, sorry for that uh, spelling mistake they call it, it's implications. And I will wrap up now with these final two slides. For me, decoloniality requires a revisiting of both Eurocentrism and Afrocentric thinking. On the one hand, from a perspective of the global north, we need to recognize that for me, there's not really much that is modern about colonialism. And if I think about my colleague, Heno Weber, I agree that we've moved into this new digital world, but the strategies are still the same. 
those strategies of manipulation, controlling data, controlling knowledge, trying to manipulate behaviors, those are the same. And I believe we can find them in Africa. We can find those roots amongst indigenous communities. At the same time, Europe did not create capitalism or individualism or stratification. They learned from the indigenous societies that they encountered. Neither did the global north introduce knowledge, science, and philosophy. Look at ancient Egypt. More than 3,200 3, years ago, I'm not even going to Ethiopia. Ethiopia is older than Egypt. But knowledge and science and philosophy, medicine, all of those strategies, all of those sciences are found amongst our people. But they were not distributed equally. So four and five colleagues. My point is that colonialism is rooted in the fractures of indigenous societies. And that is how we came to experience slavery and social and economic stratification. Thank you. Now, from an Afrocentric perspective, I think, and not just Afrocentric, from an Afrocentric and indigenous perspective, we need to recognize that pre-colonial inequalities enabled colonialism. There were always collaborators amongst indigenous people across the globe. And secondly, we know that slavery and dispossession of African land and resources was inhumane. However, for thousands of years before that encounter indigenous and African peoples, so finally, colleagues, my point is that genuine decolonial and genuine Afrocentric or wherever you situate yourself in the globe requires awareness of pre-colonial knowledge on the one hand and philosophies and also modes of organization that enabled egalitarian modes of living, but then changed to stratification and division and oppression. Thank you, colleagues. Okay, thank you so much, Oscar. Uh, this was this was really powerful. <laughs> I have I also made many notes, <laughs> uh, but I think um, we can open now uh, for uh, questions. Uh, if you uh, want to participate, you can uh, raise your little virtual hand, or you can write something uh, on on the chat is also okay and for people uh, and for people watching on YouTube you can also ask questions there on the on the live chat there and uh, we are going to read here. Anyone want to go first? Okay, Genoveva. Just uh, while, while we have uh, questions uh, for, from the audience, um, of course, um, well, I, I am going to say my two questions and then you can decide whether you gathered several or well, the way you want. So uh, the first one is, uh, uh, this is a kind of more than a question, it's a comment. We, we interacted with each other previously. And I was telling Oscar when I first read his statement, that uh, it moved my <laughs> my head uh, because of many reasons. Suddenly, I saw uh, the point that I was uh, trying to denunciate in the in this uh, digital context, uh, represented in a non-digital manner uh, in in his statement. And uh, many of the elements that uh, he uh, develops are there but now they are algorithms and data <laughs> and uh, uh and with regard to activism i uh, well we we talk to each other and the thing is that i would say and maybe others in the audience can comment or uh, my colleagues that um uh it's that that we figuring out the new world, a new possibility, is a very complex exercise. 
because if Oscar is right, <laughs> and if it goes back into ages, this means that we have to uncover all these strata that are in our minds in order to expect thinking different. And this is something that I, every time I listen to him or I read his statement, it moves my neurons. I, and I'm sometimes even sad about this because uh, it looks like a very huge project. So that's a, a comment that I wanted to, to make with respect to Oscar. And then uh, to Luis, I, when I was, uh, when you were presenting the, the different, um, versions uh, um, of the song, um, I was thinking about whether it would be make sense to uh, study what happens. Well, I always get back to my digital world, OK? To uh, uh, streaming platforms. Would it be possible maybe to see how these uh, songs that well they are not in the billboard of the <laughs> of the global north <laughs> but whether it would be possible to trace maybe the the rhythm or maybe the words or uh, the uh, musical images used in the compositions but how they evolve in in these platforms are they considered are, do they appear somewhere um in this uh, collection so that was my question uh we have a question on the chat uh to genoveva so i think we do a block here and then we can uh return valeria lopez uh she wrote in spanish and in english as well uh i'm going to read in english uh, to keep a, a a pattern um I find interesting your call to add to the decolonial feminist revolution the action from various metaverses. In the paper, you briefly mentioned the ecological impact of current technology, given this. I would like to know how a metaversal approach based on the use of technologies that are also based on the plundering of materials from community feminists defending their bodies, territories from the mining companies can have another way of functioning. In Ecuador, we had this debate and we didn't have a unique answer because the new digital streets of, oh, I'm sorry. I lost it, of the new digital streets uh, of heteropatriarchal violence are in the hegemonic social networks. But given the high ecological impact of cyber feminist proposals, maybe you could repeat the experiences you pointed out of projects so that I can write them down and preview them. Um, I'm also uh, I'm going to uh, to do uh, some uh, a few comments uh, just um, okay uh, so uh, the thing that struck me most is that the three presentations are focusing uh, in some sense in the creation of identities um, that are in a way looking to be somewhat the colonial in some sense. So we're looking into uh, uh, the past here with Oscar, uh, this, this creation of a, a colonial, I really liked uh, this term, so I wrote it down, uh, colonize, colonization of the mind and how uh, technology are used as tools for domination. We also see this with uh, Genoveva's uh, work as well, how today we are still employing these same methods that um, as controversial as it seems for me, it's a bit controversial uh, because we tend to pinpoint Europe as the sole responsible for uh, the colonization process. And that is not at all true. We cannot say that for sure. And we can even trace these coloniz colonization patterns uh, um, from Africa itself. Uh, and also uh, we can uh, see strategies and I see uh, uh, this very well in Genoveva and Luis, but also responses 
to this type of uh, um, imposition. So identities are created, people will still exist and survive despite uh, the, uh, the oppressions. So uh, this is really powerful um, and uh, this is really important uh, to debate today. And uh, it's not a, a, a question, it's more of a comment, but this is really important uh, to comment today because we are still trying uh, to, to see how to deal with uh, colonial and patriarchal stances in the society and how to change this hegemonic way of thinking. Uh, yeah, and I do have a comment, uh, Louise, in the Amalia uh, version of uh, Kalunga, right? Did she listed? Uh, is, is the composer, the original composer listed? Because I know that um, uh, music history always is always denouncing uh, that, uh, especially when something comes from the south and goes uh, to the north, and we have this really complex relationship with Portugal, between Brazil and Portugal. Uh, sometimes uh, people that are really important to a music produ production are left out of it, like they are erased and they are effectively historically erased from these productions. So I wanted to know if there's some sort of reference or some sort of recognition from the original production. Um, thanks. <laughs> yes, Oscar. Thank you. Colleagues, um, I was equally shaking over here, literally listening to my colleague Heno Weber's uh, talk. However, I, I am confident that in her talk and in Louisa's talk, those are the solutions. One, undoubtedly, we need new metaverses, undoubtedly. And how we acquire those, those knowledge and those skills, colleagues, I think is something that we all, we need to go away and we need to think about that. Secondly, Louise has, has given us probably the most powerful ammunition because knowledge is not always um, is not conveyed the most effectively amongst writers or academics even. People respond to music. Music has always been at the center of indigenous society's knowledge systems. So for me, just to summarize colleagues, and I'm, I'm almost pleading with us here, and I hope that we can find a pathway forward. If we can combine those metaverses that Hinoveva spoke of and link it with the arts and the music that Louise um, emphasized. Colleagues, I believe there are great solutions there. Thank you. Can I respond and go on? First, I would like to thank the presentation of uh, Oscar and Renoveva and all the contributions that you made. It's a very important to me as a, a, a initial researcher talk with you and think together. So I, I will try to, 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 to mix and condensate the, the, the appointment that you made about the, the, the Maracatu and the Kalunga song. Uh, and the, the question of Beatriz as well. So uh, I think when I, I was writing the abstract and the article, I did a, a very intense research in a, a website called Emeroteca. It's a, a database of uh, uh, old papers, old journals. So I, I was looking for trace the, the path of the music just in, in Pernambuco and uh, ending in, in Portugal. So uh, I, th this trace is very dense and contradictory, but at the same time, it, uh, uh, how can I say this, has implications of, uh, let me reformulate, <laughs> sorry. Uh, 
So, um, did Capiba listen the, the the version of of Amalia? Yes, he listened. I I found a, a article in 1967 when he he was talking about the the how, how glad he uh, he was to listen and and at the same time he not uh, he did not. Uh, Tension the, the the changes that Amalia made because one of the 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 principal points to me in the music is, is the percussion. The percussion is a, is a very powerful uh, tool, music tool to to achieve certain thoughts about music, about coloniality, about black music, and Amalia just uh, eliminated the percussion. Uh, but he he did not say about that. And uh, I think uh, answer Renoveva, that's a, a, a path that I cannot trace very well, very well, uh, despite of this, this article. That's not a, a, a very information, very primary information. But uh, here in the, the platforms, uh, just now in the present, that has been uh, several versions of the same song. One of the uh, one of them I would like to, to put in highlight, highlight. It's a version for a, from a, a Brazilian singer, a female Brazilian singer called uh, Jussara Silveira. She released an album uh, just with uh, music uh, musics from Angola or musics that speak about Angola, and when we are talking Kalunga, they say from Sao Paulo de Luanda. Luanda Sao Paulo de Luanda was the first name of Luanda, né? Yeah. And the, this, the, this version of Jussara Silveira is very interesting because in, once in the, the platform like Spotify, uh, Deezer, YouTube, that has been a revival of the song. So people in Angola liked it very much and speak about it. People in Brazil speak about it, and uh, I think that is a, a very interesting strategy because uh, once this music travels with the, this digital platform, uh, at the same time you have a, a larger groups like Spotify that is a capitalist groups, but at the same time we have this kind of music that's very interesting, seen very powerful, and so uh, finalizing with. with the, the claiming of, of Oscar, I think we can think about this, this metaverse combined with musical metaverse, metaverses. And so this, the both of presentations were very powerful, powerful to me because despite the, uh, I researched the past, at the same time, uh, these callings, these Afro, Afrocentric implications and these, uh, let me see, Feminist digital revolt or resistance, resistances and tools. And it's very interesting because we can think a, a way in between, a way that we connect in between these, these harms of larger groups or capitalist organizations. We can travel between always fighting, always resistance, always in resistance, but always in in how can I say that? That the, the opposite of resistance is insistence, I think, in Portuguese at least. <laughs> insistência. So uh, at the same time, we are, we are resisting, we are insisting, we are fighting back. So that's, I, I, I don't know if I make myself clear because I, I travel a lot, and, but it, it is it. And so uh, I, did not raise my hand, but I would. I was a, a comment. I, I have a comment about the the presentation of Oscar and Renoveva, uh, because I, I, in the, this thing that you spoke about the writing and the the big data, the, this mixing and the, the the relation of these two terms and these two universe, I think we can speak about. Uh, I can I, I think I can think about the maracatu in, in basis of this this way of, of thought. I, I think it was just this and I really like to thank you both of you and Beatrice too. Uh,
fine. Okay. Uh, uh, Hinoveva, do you want to uh, answer? I see that you wrote. Uh... Yes, I wrote a comment, uh, an answer for the comment of Valeria. And we are even in contact now. <laughs> 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 create networks is good yeah I think um, I don't know if someone uh, has one more comment want to point out something else um, in case uh, we don't yes in case we don't then I, I think we can uh, it was really interesting this panel I am I am blown away. I, <laughs> you guys, you know, like <laughs> I, I love it. Yes, <laughs> thank you so much, the three of you. It was amazing uh, uh, to think that even interdisciplinary thinking can meet has uh, a point of connection, point of conflict. Um, uh, this is a really amazing. Really, uh, it's always. Uh, makes me really proud of the work we are doing. <laughs> so I really want to thank the, the three of you uh, for everything. I want to thank Sara, Lieli, I want to thank Karina as well. She's not here. Professor Susanne Gomegu, yeah, I think she was here. Maybe she's here still. Um, thank you, everyone. And now uh, we are going to follow the, the programmation in a half hour, uh, more or less, we are going to have a closing table uh, to, to finish our discussions and wrap it up everything really beautifully. It would be great to see you all there. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, colleagues. See you in some minutes.